My name's Rasheen, and I'm sick of reading. Yes, I am wearing a turtleneck in May. I wanted to look scholarly. It's coming off straight after this video. <laughs> Hello friends and welcome to a bit of a different video from me. I've never filmed a book review before, but I thought since I have been banging on about these books for the last six or seven weeks, um, that it would be high time that I filmed a review about them. So I'm going to be reviewing the entire series, um, and if you've seen the title you know which books I'm reviewing, and that is the Thomas Cromwell Trilogy by Hilary Mantel. So we've got Wolf Hall, which I listened to the audiobook so I don't have a physical copy of, Bring Up the Bodies, and <laughs> The Big Boy, The Mirror and Light. If you've watched any of my videos for the last two months, you will know how much I have loved all of these books. Um, I listened to Wolf Hall a few years ago, but Bring Up the Bodies and The Mirror and the Light I read in March and April. It was no surprise to me that I absolutely adored these books because literary historical fiction is my favourite genre of books of all time. Full stop. Um, I'm actually going to film a 10 literary historical fiction recommendations that will be coming out after this video. And I loved Wolf Hall so much when I finally listened to it, but I was so happy that this this monster of a book lived up to all of the hype that that is that comes from having two Booker Prize winners in the series, waiting eight years between the releases of the two books. If you don't know anything about the Thomas Cromwell trilogy by Hilary Mantel, then it is a trilogy of books about Thomas Cromwell, self-evidently enough. Um, I will be talking spoilers in this review, and that is for two main reasons. The first reason is that this is history that is nearly 500 years old, and it is quite famous history at that. So even though you might not know, <laughs> you probably don't know, all of the intricate details of Thomas Cromwell's story, you will know some of what the facts of what is going to happen, even if you've just listened to the soundtrack of the musical Six, or even if you only, even if the only thing you know about Henry VIII is divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived, then you know some of the <laughs> facts about what is going to happen in these two books. The second reason that I feel like it's okay to talk about spoilers when you're talking about these books is that Hilary Mantel knew that going into these books. She knew that people know this history, whether they know it in depth or they just know a bit about it. She knew that some people who read this would be Tudor scholars who have studied Thomas Cromwell's life, and most of her readers would have a vague grasp of what was going to happen. And yet she still manages to skillfully weave in suspense and intrigue for even the most learned of Tudor scholar. I'm not a Tudor scholar myself, but I think that that is probably true. So Thomas Cromwell was Henry VIII's consigliere, his fixer. He saw what the king's needs and whims were and predicted them for him and got what he needed done. So when he needed a divorce from Catherine of Aragon, Thomas Cromwell fixed it for him. And when his new wife, Anne Boleyn, was not producing heirs, Thomas Cromwell sorted that out too. Uh, when he needed money, Thomas Cromwell dissolved the monasteries. But in the end, all of that worked against him, when Thomas Cromwell ended up on the wrong side of Henry VIII. We all know how that ends. The first reason that I love this trilogy so much is that it is so immersive. I would get lost in the Tudor court for hours and come to confused as to why I wasn't in the 16th century. The way that Mantel uses language is so skillful, sprinkling in words like paped or grelocked in order to give us a sense of the time period without having to go overboard and full Shakespearean in a way that would make it difficult for the modern reader to, to properly and easily understand. Or else she will use words that are almost entirely modern, but use phrasing or syntax that gives a sense of the time period in which it comes from. Say, so she will say things like, so say we all, or no man shall have a fowl in his pot, but he pay a levy on it, which is not something that we would say at all today, but it gives a feeling of the time in which the book is set. But it is not just through the language used by the characters in the novel that give this sense of our time period. We are inside Thomas Cromwell's head. The narrative is as near to an inner monologue as maybe, and the richness of the description is so incredible. We not only hear his thoughts, but we inhabit his sensory experience of the time period, seeing the world through his eyes. 
We understand, for example, the richness of the fabrics worn by the ladies, counted up to the shilling by Thomas Cromwell, for he used to be a garmenter himself, and little pieces of a life that has now been lost to us are interspersed through the novel in delicate sprinklings to allow us to see a life that we no longer would understand. For example, when Thomas Cromwell's wife is braiding pieces of silk attached to a hook, on the wall in order to, for her to do it, her head bowed. We see a whole range of Tudor life in these books, from the lowest born to the absolute highest in King Henry VIII and the middle classes as well. Cromwell started life as a, the son of a blacksmith, running wild in Putney and beaten to a pulp by his father. But as his star rises, he becomes a merchant man with his family at home, poring over ledgers and, and putting on Twelfth Night plays with his family, until eventually he rises to be the Earl of Essex before his death. We are treated to swoony language and dark stylistic passages that imitate the Dutch masters of the day, writing the food and the fabrics, the jewels and the spices, the tapestries and the wines, it all feels sensorily real for us. Mantel spares nothing in her descriptions. From the opening scene of Wolf Hall, where Cromwell is lying on the cobblestones being kicked to a pulp by his father, to the sumptuous weddings to Berlin, to Seymour, to Clee. And it is not just the way she describes the period setting, that is so miraculous about her language. It is beautiful beyond that. So many of the passages I read over and over again because of their beauty. We are inside the head of a philosophical thinker, and the way that he thinks is glorious. Not all of his musings are short, some are whole paragraphs or even whole pages, um, but I will read you a few quotes just so you can see the style in which he works. Anne's love is a phantom gentleman, flitting by night with adulterous intent. They come and go by night, unchallenged. They skim over the river like midges, flicker against the dark, their doublets sewn with diamonds. The moon sees them, peering from her hood of bone, and Thames water reflects them, glimmering like fish, and like pearls. And the word, however, is like an imp coiled beneath your chair. It induces ink to form words you have not yet seen, and lines to march across the pages and overshoot the margin. There are no endings. I think so, you are deceived as to their nature. They are beginning. Here is one. The brilliance of these novels comes also in their structure. The plot is as meticulously shaped as the best thriller. Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies imitate each other as we follow the rise and rise of Thomas Cromwell, from beaten son of a smith at the very beginning to the king's right-hand man. And in each of these, he weaves a spider web in order to trap the people that he needs to bring down to pull up his own star. Wolf Hall, he captures Thomas More in his own words, and More loses his head. In Bring Up the Bodies, the queen he crowned at the end of Wolf Hall is herself wrapped up in her own intrigues, and Anne Boleyn is the one who ends up on the chopping block. We see how he uses them against themselves, talks in half-truths and twists what they have said in order to catch them in like a lawyer in their comeuppance, until they are trapped in what seems to be true, what could almost be true what might be true. And these two novels are mirrored almost entirely in mirror and the light. Uh, Crom we see Watch Cromwell, whose star seems to be continuing to rise. He's getting further and further into the King's trust, but like breadcrumbs, a trail of his missteps are led throughout the novel for us to follow. And in the end, it is he who is ensnared in a trap of his own making. The brilliance of this structure lies in the knowledge that we have going into the novel. You would think it would be impossible to raise the tension so high in a book where we know the outcome. It should feel inevitable that Cromwell is going to die. We should be willing her to hurry up, but Mantel writes the novel in the present tense and sits us on Cromwell's shoulder. Instead of being outside him with the knowledge of the full timeline, instead we are walking with him, inexorably towards the end, unable to warn him or tell him of what is coming. She is the master of dramatic irony, deftly and gently laying down incidents to hint at his comeuppance. He is saying that he will be the one to bring down Gardiner or Norfolk. He is saying that if anyone tries to bring back Rome back into the English church, he will take up arms against them, even the king. It all seems like small things, insignificant things, things that won't get back to the king, except that because we know what will happen, it sticks in your mind, like red flags walking Cromwell to the chopping block. The events of the last novel span four years, and so much happens that halfway through, like 500 pages in, I was surprised that Jane Seymour was still alive because we had to go through Anne of Cleves before we ended Cromwell. But the novel picks up pace the foot closer you get to the end until it is tearing like a runaway train. Cromwell, who has been the puppet master of the past two novels, has lost control and the events come thick and fast. He is powerless to stop them. Mantel is also a master of character. Cromwell is so complex that I feel as if I know him and have known him for years. Each aspect of his motivations are clearly laid out. We follow his train of thought, the way it bends around corners, and the way he flashes back to memories, or else talks with the ghosts, of those he loved like Wolsey and his wife, and of those he brought to death. 
And Tyler said that this trilogy is essentially a series of ghost stories. Tyler manages to write the way that people think without losing control. <laughs> there are scenes in which Cromwell's memory is dropped drogged by something that happens and he follows the thought down memory lane until suddenly he is interrupted part way through and has to go and deal with something else but then he picks up the thread later on when he is alone and that memory and the thing that jogged the memory and even the event that happened in the interval all serve to illuminate each other the memory that he comes back to is not the same memory that he had because something has happened in the middle and altered the way he is thinking about it but it's not just Cromwell who is fleshed out I have never read a book by anyone else who can write groups of characters the way that Mantel can the subtle way characters alter the way they talk, depending on who they're talking to, the little interplays between the people, the women at court, the men at court, when Catherine Howard arrives new and Lady Rochford is the sister-in-law of Anne Boleyn, who has been there for years, is sneering and judging, but we all know what will happen to Lady Rochford and Catherine Howard. The group that is particularly good is the group of men who live with Cromwell, his son, his uh, nephew Richard Cromwell, um, Call Me Risley, and uh, Rafe Sadler. You can see who is older, who is closer to Cromwell at that point in time. You can see the way they laugh at each other, all jockeying for a position. They seem like real people who have really known each other for years. She manages to portray relationships, standing, hi hidden feelings, all within a few lines of dialogue. There's not a formula to it. It feels so real and fluid and changeable. This is my favourite trilogy of all time. Possibly my favourite historical fiction of all time. Maybe even my favourite books. <laughs> they are rich and beautiful. There's so much more to them. I could talk about this forever. I could write essays on it, write a dissertation on these books. And I, and I definitely am going to have to read them all again one day. Although maybe not right now. I would just say that if you want to get lost in a world, in a man, if you want to feel your heart rise into your throat because you know what is going to happen, if you want a book that feels a bit like you are shouting at people in a horror movie not to go into that room, yet they are pulled ever forward, then you should read these books. I'll leave you with one final quote from The Mirror and the Light. Can you make a New England? You can write a new story. You can write new texts and destroy the old ones. Set the torn leaves of Duns Scotus sailing about the quadrangles and place the Gospels in every church. You can write on England. But what was written before keeps showing through. Thank you for watching my first ever book review. I hope you liked it. If you have read these books or you would like to read these books, let me know in the comments down below. I would really like to hear from you. And give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, please. I would really appreciate that. Um, and you can also subscribe because I will be back the day after tomorrow with a brand new video. Thank you for watching and I will see you again soon. Bye bye!